All right, we are live on uh, Facebook and we are recording. I'm John Murray, sir. For those of you who are not who, who are, aren't familiar with me, I'm at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and this podcast is our sports science conversation as part of the UNLV Sports Innovation Initiative. And we've got a special guest today. We've got Dr. David Ferguson on. Hi, David. How are you? I'm doing great, John. Thanks for having me here. Oh, well, thank you so much for uh, joining us. And I got to give a little bit of background on uh, how we connected, which we, we did actually connect. We were just talking ahead of time, you know, early 2000s, because you are a UNLV alum. You uh, came to UNLV, you did your uh, undergraduate in kinesiology through the Honors College, which is really a fantastic uh, uh, Honors College and, and uh, learning environment. And uh, you earned your, your bachelor's in 2007. So we crossed paths early in the uh, 2000s. And of course, I asked the question, was I nice back then? And hopefully I was. So <laughs> Very nice. Uh, you're my first kinesiology advisor. So you did well. I've done well. So it works out. There you go. And what's funny is the way that we've reconnected recently is because of a graduate student I was working with, Johnny Spilatro, who's a race car driver. And he was uh, doing his his uh, capstone project for his graduate program on uh, the physiology and biomechanics of race car driving. And somewhere along the way, he was you know searching references, and he reached out to you because yep. you have literally written a textbook on uh, physiology of race car driving, yep. and uh, made that connection that he's at UNLV, you've been to UNLV, and then he connected me with you, and I immediately reached out. I was just so impressed with. Uh, the academic career that you've had, uh, or you have, and uh, and that you're building, and this is going to be a lot of fun to uh, to chat about that, how you got to where you're at, but also your uh, research on uh, race car driving. Yeah, no, absolutely. I am thrilled. Like, I've been looking forward to this for the past couple of weeks, reminiscing about the good old days uh, yeah. being back in Vegas. So, uh, no, thank you for having me. I'm really grateful to Johnny, and yeah, uh, let's do it. Fire away. Awesome. Well, yeah, and we'll, you know, we can chat a little bit. Campus has changed a little bit, uh, although it's still the same footprint, but we have some newer buildings now, so uh, it has changed, but maybe at some point we'll get you come back to, to Vegas and, and visit. So let's start with your academic career. And I, I didn't ask you ahead of time, where were you originally from and how did you end up at UNLV? And then where did you go from there? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So uh, a lot of it really started with my dad. Uh, my dad is was a professor, and he went through the ranks of academia. He went from an assistant professor all the way up to a university president. Um, and I'll tell this story. It ties back into UNLV, and you might know who my dad is, actually. So um, I was born in Southern California uh, in Whittier, which is just outside of Los Angeles. And when I was four, my dad moved the family to Monroe, Louisiana. Uh, he became a professor at it was Northeast Louisiana University at the time. It's now become University of Louisiana at Monroe. So we stayed there till I was 14. And then as luck would have it, he got a job as Dean of the Graduate School at UNLV. So we moved to Las Vegas when I was 14. And I went through high school uh, in Las Vegas, which I mean, if you go to high school in Las Vegas, it is not the normal experience. I thought it was normal. I've since left Nevada and found out it was not a normal experience. Yeah. And so, you know, at the time, uh, you know, a high school kid in Las Vegas, it, the, to me, the vibe seemed everyone wanted to go to college in California. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to go to school in California. I want to do this. Um, but kind of two really important things happened that actually shaped my career for the better. Uh, we're going to talk about my race car stuff. So obviously, I'm very much into cars. You can kind of see them back here and into racing. And unfortunately, I was involved in a, a pretty bad car accident when I was 18. Oh, wow. And going through the recovery process, uh, there was kind of this notion of maybe you should stay in Nevada because your doctors are here, your physical therapists are here. Like going out of state at a time when you're still healing may not have been a good idea, mm -hmm. especially to go be on your own as a 19-year-old. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, which I honestly don't know is still a thing it was when I was a high school kid, uh, there was the Nevada Millennium Scholarship, which basically if you got a certain GPA in high school, you got a big chunk of your college paid for. So, you know, I was kind of looking at this thing of, you know, health-wise, it's better to stay. Um, 
I get college paid for. You go to California, you pay as state tuition for California, which was horrible. Right. And, you know, my parents kind of made me the deal. They're like, well, if you stay, you can, um, you know, you had, I had scholarships and the money you get back from that, you can put that towards your cars. Mm -hmm. And I was like, even better. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure if that's the answer you're looking for, or why I picked UNLV. It was just this great, you know, coming together, the right things, the right time. And it turned out to be amazing for me. It was an amazing college experience. Uh, so I entered UNLV. I was a kinesiology pre-med major. Mm -hmm. my, at the time, my goal was to go be an orthopedic surgeon. So I entered as a kinesiology major. I was also in the honors college. And, you know, we'll kind of talk about how well, this progressed to the other places I've gone. Um, but I kind of had a come to Jesus moment as I was going through this of, I'm not really passionate about medicine. Like I, I, I think people that go into medicine, go to med school are amazing, talented, brilliant people, but I wasn't really into it for, I think the right reasons. I was like, I've noticed myself saying, well, I'm going to do it to keep buying my race cars, which you're going to notice there's a trend here of how this works out. So um, I, I, truly fell in love with kinesiology, particularly exercise physiology. Um, I'm, you know, I took a couple classes uh, from actually, there were graduate students at the time that talked about some of the cool work they were doing and how much fun it was. Uh, there was a lot of work kind of going on around, uh, well, you know, running biomechanics, uh, exercise metabolism. Uh, I think I took a class from someone named, I think like there was like a Steve Young and Armstrong, yeah. Dr. Armstrong was there. Yeah. And so I had these great experiences and being in Vegas, driving race cars in the summer, it's 120 degrees outside. And uh, I was involved in a, a race and I got out of the car, I got third. And I was like, I went up to the guy that got second who was driving a piece of junk. And I was like, hey, man, great job, really impressive, uh, you know, drive. I don't know how you did it. And he's like, what are you talking about? Like, I got fourth. And we talked a little bit. And what we realized was he was so dehydrated, he was seeing triple. Oh. And, you know, you kind of, you know, being a kid at the time, not really what dehydration and heat stroke looks like. Mm -hmm. Looking back on, you know, he's bright red. He can't mm -hmm. speak really eyeball. Uh oh, we have a internet connectivity issue. Hopefully, uh, David will jump back on in, in uh, just a second. So we will pause here. I'm loving this story, though. And... Come on, internet. Okay, he's uh, reconnecting. So let's uh, let's just we'll we'll pause here for a second, and uh, hopefully he'll jump on. There we go. John, oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. I was in the moment of talking about my career and the power went off at my house. And so yeah. we lost oh, everything, no. but I think we're back. <laughs> That'll happen. That's no problem. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I am loving this story. I One, I did not make that connection with your dad, who was really a fantastic, you know, addition to UNLV when he came here and a big, big shoes to, to fill when he left. And that was fantastic because I had a lot of interactions with him. And oh, cool. really enjoyed that. So, uh, so that's so cool. But I'm really loving this story in terms of you know starting down one path, medical school, and and deciding that wasn't for you. And I, you know, I always tell students, hey, if you can rule things out, you're actually making yeah. progress. And so yeah. that's neat that you're finding you know your your way as you go through these different classes. And you know, if you enjoy the class, sometimes that's a good sign that you enjoy the area. So yeah. I also did not know that you were a race car driver. Yeah, well, let's put that in quotes a bit. <laughs> I, I have driven cars quickly yeah. on a truck. Yeah. After meeting some of the people I've worked with, I do not put myself in that category. <laughs> you know, it's like, 
you know, I kind of, you know, say like there's the guy that likes to run track and then he meets Usain Bolt and he realized he's not a track oh, star. I don't know about so, that. that. That sounds like, but uh, okay. And where you were uh, when, when the power cut out was you were telling this story, which it sounds like this is your link into pursuing academics further where you finished a race and you were talking with one of the other race car drivers and sounded like he was dehydrated. Yeah. So super dehydrated. Um, and, you know, I kind of started to have this thought spark of there is so much effort and engineering that goes into making the car fast. I mean, just the engineering, the suspension, the aerodynamics, the tires, but yet the squishy human driving the car gets no attention, right? right. So, you know, you've obviously spoken to Johnny yeah. and you probably heard, told him like, hey, can you get some more references for your capstone project? And he's like, no, they're not out there. And that's true. Right. Like, right. When I started this, I think there were maybe 20 papers on like human performance, sports medicine of race car drivers. Yeah. Very, very limited. Yeah. So I just started Googling and trying to find stuff. And, you know, I kind of thought like, well, what I'm interested in is kinesiology. Like I'm interested in this human performance aspect. And I, I like race car drivers and motorsports. Started Googling it. And I found uh, an exercise physiologist at the University of North Carolina Charlotte named Tim Lightfoot, mm -hmm. who uh, we'll talk about his other research area, but his other research uh, was the genetic regulation of physical activity. We'll come back to that in a second. But he was doing um, a lot of stuff with the American College of Sports Medicine on race car drivers. And he was like, well, if you like this stuff, why don't you come do a master's in it? Wow. And I was like, OK, <laughs> you know, like I knew what a master's was through my dad. I, I knew what research was, but I was like, all right, sounds good. I'll just move cross country and do this and start this. So uh, went to Charlotte. Uh, entered their master's in clinical exercise physiology mm -hmm. and did my thesis on core temperature in NASCAR pit crews. <laughs> so the idea was that uh, drivers and crew members wear these fire protective suits mm -hmm. that are as insulating as a winter ski suit. And then they have to go exercise for four hours in the summer heat, right. basically. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got a very small grant to buy a, uh, temper a core temperature sensor that, you know, you swallow a pill that measures core temperature and sends it to this little box that is like this size now. And, um, on my own dime drove to five races in the Southeastern United States to collect this data with one NASCAR cup team. Oh. And, you know, had the best experience of my yeah. life. Yeah. I drove, there was one race, there was a hurricane uh, on a trip to Atlanta. I got two flat tires <laughs> and I loved it. That's I was like, true. this is it. Like, here we go. This is no. fantastic. Uh -huh. um, so this was in 2008, 2009. And if you, know, you, if you kind of remember your history, we had a big economic crash at that time. No. So... My plan was I was going to take my master's and I was going to go work in NASCAR. Mm -hmm. I was going to, you know, kind of be a human performance specialist, strength and conditioning coach, something kind of in that realm, which didn't really exist. And uh, we had the economic crash. And so if all the economy crashes for the businesses, they're not going to give $20 million to the race teams to go drive in a circle. Mm -hmm. And so they said, hey, can't drive the car. You can't build the car. We don't get a job for you. All right. So uh, I went back to Tim and he made the statement. like, you know, when the economy goes bad, people go back to school. Oh. He's like, you like research. Why don't you get a PhD? Mm -hmm. And, you know, kind of the other thing that had happened at this dual time. So while I was at UNLV, I think it's still there, but there was like the... Uh, Harry Reid Center for Environmental Studies. Yep, that's right. Um, You're still here. Yep. Cool. So yeah. I was an undergrad intern there. I yeah. did a research project in the microbiology lab. Yeah. And you know, this is going to date me, but when I did it, uh, PCR or polymerase chain reaction was a new thing. So okay. just kind of you know how old this was. Yeah. So Tim was using that technique in his lab to understand the genetic regulation of physical activity. Mm -hmm. 
And he was, so while I was doing the motorsport stuff, I was also helping him in his other lab. And he was like, why don't you stay and get your PhD? Um, you're, you're good at the molecular stuff. You know, you can work in the motorsport side, you know, like this is a good avenue. And I was like, sounds great. Mm -hmm. um, in the back of my head, I was thinking, yeah, I'll, I'll do this PhD thing on the side and really work in motorsports. And anyone that's ever gone to get a PhD, it is not a part-time gig. <laughs> no, that's it's right. not even close. So started my PhD at UNC Charlotte. The PhD was actually in integrative biology. And about a year in, Tim came to me and said, hey, I've just taken a job at Texas A&M University. Do you want to come with me? They'll let me bring a doc student. And I said, sure, let's do it. So moved to Texas A&M, did my PhD in exercise physiology. I wanted to do like motorsport as my dissertation. And the quote he gave me was, why don't you do real science? Because no one's gonna fund motorsport work. You know, it's really hard to publish this stuff. And it's true, like I would submit papers in motorsports and get comments back of, these are not athletes. Um, this is not a true sport. We don't mm -hmm. publish this stuff. This is, you know, it was a, a wall. We'll, we'll talk about how we got through that. So I did my dissertation on the genetic regulation of physical activity, specifically studying mouse muscle and how if you alter a couple of genes in the mouse muscle, you can alter physical activity. And lo and behold, at the time, the genes I was looking in are highly influenced by what you eat as a baby. So there was a investigator named Marta Fioroto at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston that was studying early life growth restriction. Hmm. So if you are growth restricted as a baby, you've got a 47% increased risk of getting heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and really no one knows why. And Marta thought it had a lot to do with uh, skeletal muscle metabolism and the genes. And she was looking at the same genes I was. And when you go to a postdoc, you've got a nice synergy. It's great. So I went, I did a postdoc. Um, we did some really cool stuff, found some really cool things on that. A lot about tied to what you eat, how that influences your microbiome and bile acids and how that leads to heart disease. And so anyway, did all that stuff. Got recruited to come to Michigan State University because they do pediatric kinesiology mm -hmm. and they were looking for a mouse person. So I show up thinking that, you know, I've done this thing. Uh, the motorsports is kind of a side gig. Like maybe I'll bring drivers to the lab and do VO2 max tests. So I show up to Michigan State University. I'm ready to do my research. I walk into my lab and they say, sorry, the lab is going to have an 18 month construction delay. Oh. So a lot of this, the molecular stuff I do required a lot of special equipment and infrastructure mm -hmm. and they were just behind. Yeah. So kind of sat there for you know a couple months I prepped my new classes I published stuff on my postdoc you know wrote a couple of review papers and you know still no new lab and you know for I, I'm not sure who's watching this on it but if they're a professor and they've gone through the annual evaluation process yeah. um, I went through my annual evaluation process and I got slaughtered Oh. They're like, where are your new papers, you know, grant submissions, all this stuff. And I was like, I don't have a lab. No. How am I supposed to do this without a lab? So, you know, I was sitting there one day and I kind of, you know, when you get a job as a you know assistant professor, they give you a startup package. And I kind of allocated my stuff to different regions. And I left a little pot, like an emergency pot of when like, if my first study blows up, I got, I can go redo it. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting there and I was like, I've got like three halo projects in motorsports I want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, Indianapolis is a four hour drive for me. Right. I, you know, i still have connections to NASCAR F1 and sports car race. I'm like, I'm just going to go do those. Mm -hmm. And like, if they don't give me tenure and fire me because I didn't get my lab up and running, I'm going to do the three projects I want to do. Right. So I did them that kicked off a lot of interest in motorsports. We can talk about the projects and all that. Um, my other lab was eventually built and it's been successfully funded and we've done work from it. Um, turns out a lot of the stuff we were doing led to the fact that what you eat as a baby actually determines your ability to respond to exercise as an adult. So mm -hmm. we started getting non-responders to exercise stuff. 
And uh, yeah, in between that, I try and sleep here and there, but that's kind of been my journey. And I've talked quite a lot and my power cut up on me because I think it was tired of me hearing you talking, but I'll, I'll pause and I'll, I'll let you oh, lead your podcast. I love this. I mean, here it is. Your, your, this, this path that you're following is because you're following your passion. And yeah. I, I love that. And I think that's such a great message to give out there is keep pursuing what you're interested in. And in this case, it was race car driving, which took you to your master's, took you yeah. to your PhD. And even though you, you shifted to do another line of research, there's obviously still a connection there. That's such a fantastic message. Mm -hmm. you. And yeah, your 10 o'clock click, you know, running and, and all of a sudden you don't have a lab. But to be able to pivot and go back to that and 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 dive into that, uh, that that's just such a, a neat uh, evolution of of your uh, your career and and now like I, I I started with I mean you have literally written the textbook on the physio the science of motorsport and uh, that is just and and I I let me just steal from your uh, your forward that you wrote in that. Um, that, that book is, and I'll just read this, uh, as an exercise physiologist, I've always said I am a mechanical engineer for the human body. I love that. Uh, where I, I examine stress placed on the body and then develop strategies through training and nutrition to improve human performance. I mean, that is just so, that, that, that's such a nice way to describe what you do. And yeah, race car drivers are athletes, right? Yeah, well, so, you know, one of my Halo projects was to document that. Because, you know, they they really weren't considered that. And, you know, it became an issue where the joke was, oh, they just sit there. They, the car does all the work. But then on more of a, a public health perspective, you know, they were not getting access to health care, really. So hmm. you have, you know, we'll just take football because everyone knows football. A professional NFL team has, you know, team physicians, athletic trainers, nutritionists, exercise physiologists. Race car drivers have none of that. They have to pay out of pocket for it because it's mm -hmm. not really been accepted as a sport. So we uh, decided like, okay, we're going to document it. So we did a paper where we took F1 drivers, IndyCar drivers, NASCAR drivers, and sports car drivers. And we, very simple body composition, VO2 max testing. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Average VO2 max is in the high 50s, low 60s for these guys that just sit there. So, you know, it kind of became a thing of, oh, now they are athletes and the loads they're under are quite heavy. And it's nice to start to see the sports medicine world coming around and providing those services now. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is, that is fantastic. I mean, it, and, and it is interesting how, you know, our, our thoughts of what an athlete is. You don't think of a race car driver, but in reality, it is yeah. very taxing. Uh, yeah. And you talked earlier about the temperatures. It's not like these cars have air conditioning and it's just this comfortable car to, to uh, race in. So, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting. So if you if you go to the data um, on average, races are going to be two to four hours, average heart rate of about 160 beats per minute. They're going to lose depending on the type of car five to seven pounds of sweat mm, during that wow. race. Um, you know, of course, with that core temperature is going to go up. Mm -hmm. Average core temperature hits about 38 and a half, 39 C. So they're warm. Yeah. Um, you know, we've done some metabolic testing, two hour race, burning 2000 calories. Um, wow. You know, and you couple all that together with you're going 200 miles an hour you're, you know, this close to another car and you're mm -hmm. trying to make cognitive decisions that mm -hmm. if you make a mistake, yeah. it's a big hit. Mm. Oh, totally. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. Putting it in that context really does sort of give that, that impact of why this research is, is so important. So at this time that you're doing the research, uh, technology is not really at that wearable state at the, at this point of your career. So how were you innovating uh, equipment to be able to do these types of measurements? What were you What were you doing? Oh gosh, so that so that was the biggest limitation when I started doing the I started the pit crew project because there was no technology that could go in the race car. Okay, um, you know, not only was you know they're not really a a wearable you could put in the car. It mm -hmm. usually came with a giant data logger that no one would let you put in the car, right. um, and it wasn't fire safe, right? So as we were trying to get close to doing the in-car stuff, I'm not sure if you remember, there was the Red Bull space jump. 
you remember that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah like Red Bull funded, it was like the highest skydive or whatever. A guy went up into the atmosphere and then jumped out. And I, I think I was at ACSM when I saw this. Uh, they recorded biometrics on him. So they recorded like heart rate, core temperature, skin temperature, and breathing rate. And they use a device called the Equivital Life Monitor. Mm -hmm. And it looks, looks like a sports bra. It's got a two lead EKG in it, a temperature sensor, and like an elastic band that measures uh, breathing rate or ventilatory rate. But what's coupled to it is you can swallow a pill that measures core temperature. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, well, if it can work for space, mm -hmm. can it work for race car drivers? So I, I reached, so was, reached out to the, the vendor and the supplier, and I said, can you, uh, you know, lend me one? Can I look at it? Uh, I, I did not plan this, John. I've actually got one right next to me. I will show you. I didn't plan <laughs> it. Um, we, we got back from a recent data collection. They're just still sitting here. Uh, so they sent me one. And... It was lightweight. It didn't interfere with the belts. It got in the car. And so I took it uh, down to Indianapolis. I knew a couple of drivers there. I said, hey, look at this. Would you wear this in the race car? Mm. And they were like, yeah, we'd wear it. So then I went to the, the medical safety team and I said, would you let a driver wear this in the race car? And they said, only if it was covered in Nomex. And so Nomex is the fireproof material that the suits are made of. So we had them covered in Nomex. Mm. And so I kid you not, like, this is, this is it. Oh, my goodness. This is what they wear. So it kind of, you yeah. know, goes over the, like, their left arm like this. Yeah. Kind of comes around and buckles like that. And you got your little data logger that plugs in there. Um, covered in a nice Nomex that's washable and everything. And oh. so this is what we've been using since about 2015. Um, oh, I love it. Yeah, so it, it's gone through some iterations and we've had to optimize it a little bit, but it's been really nice. It, you know, you can set it to sample at a thousand hertz, which yeah. is more sampling than you need for the human body. Um, you, uh, it's got about a good 12 hours worth of battery life. So we've collected, you know, full races on it. We've done endurance races like the 24 hours of Le Mans, the 24 mm -hmm. hours of Daytona, just by swapping out battery packs. Mm. It's been great. So now, what you said was really important. You said that, you know, wearable technology has now caught up to us. Yeah. So, um, and, you know, I remember being a, a student and kind of getting into this and seeing, you know, like the polar watches and all these other wearables that were kind of gimmicky and maybe not that great. Mm -hmm. And now they've caught up and they're pretty good. Like your Apple watch is not that bad at measuring heart rate. Right. So what we've now decided to do is, can we capture similar or meaningful data from these wearables? Because mm -hmm. a lot of drivers will wear like a whoop in mm -hmm. the car. Yeah. And then you've got that whoop data for their entire day, lead up, sleep, all this stuff. So, you know, we are trying to validate that against some of our existing stuff. So we have meaningful data. I love that. And, and again, this is being so innovative with trying to, to get the equipment. And I love how you're thinking about getting the, the measurements without interfering with what the race car driver has to do. It can't be distracting, yeah. has to fit the rules and conform to the race car uh, regulations. I, I, that, uh, that's not easy to do. Um, you should see the prescription to my blood pressure medicine. That I <laughs> um, so one of the, this is where driving a car in my previous life really came into play yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you know i will never say i am on any level with these drivers but i can speak the language i do know the day they go through i do know kind of how you sit in the car what you mm -hmm. want to feel and you know i always tell i tell my students this all the time i'm like okay picture you're in the lab sitting at your desk and someone comes in and wants to put a sensor on you probe you poke you while you're like in the middle of your comprehensive exam or in the middle of doing something, right? And so we kind of set the rule for ourselves that whatever we do with a driver, our setup time needs to be under three minutes. Mm -hmm. Here you go, put this on, we'll see you after the race. Um, 
you know, we kind of, you know, built, we really worked to build a lot of trust with the drivers when we started. Um, you know, if you kind of go back to about 2010, there had been no papers published on drivers in about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And despite a lot of people trying. So you, if you go that time frame, NASCAR was huge. You know, this was the Jeff Gordon, Dale Earnhardt Jr. era. There was a ton of funding in NASCAR. Um, you had uh, IndyCar that was just kind of coming back a bit. F1, it was the end of the Michael Schumacher era. Mm -hmm. But there was no paper. There was no data. Like, if, if you, I love it, you go to PubMed, it's just zero. Mm -hmm. um, and what had happened was there were people that were trying and they were just too invasive. Mm. they were too invasive or they were trying to be a celebrity like they wanted to latch on and be like that motorsport person mm -hmm. so through my experience of kind of knowing what goes on in a race day and then knowing what drivers want and really focus on trying to build that trust and give them something for their data like i feel all too often like when we collect data we see the participant hi how are you thank you goodbye mm -hmm. Well, what do they get out of it? And, you know, we, we talk about like, I, I refuse to talk about IRBs on this. We're having too much fun to talk about IRBs. <laughs> they always say, what's the benefits of being in the study? Well, you might as well tell them something that they could use. Yeah. And these individuals, their whole life is centered around data. Yeah. They have a ton of data on the car. They're always looking at their own driving data. So they're into it and they're fairly intelligent. So we try to build this trust so that they would then welcome us into the sport. And, you know, we were a part of their team as opposed to an intrusion. I'm so glad you brought that up. That's actually one of the questions I was going to ask you is, you know, working with not only race car drivers, but the companies that yeah. fund these drivers, uh, there has to be a relationship that's built up between you and them, because there needs to be that trust factor that one, you're going to do good research, and then two, that the, the information is going to be meaningful. So that's really interesting that that's a that's an angle that you really had to had to develop. But knowing your race car background, that that really sounds like that helped that out. Yeah, absolutely. It was a uh, it got me into the door. Like mm -hmm. I, I knew how to say the right questions. Um, I remember this. I was in a meeting. I won't say the team or the race car driver because it will it'll give the punchline away. I was in a meeting with uh, a group of, you know, allied health professionals. Um, so, you know, you have, you know, exercise physiologists, nutritionists, all this stuff, neurosurgeons, all this deal. And we were speaking to a driver who had had a, a bad crash and we were working to try and get them back to be competitive. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget the neurologist asked, did the airbag go off in the car? Mm. First off, there's no airbags on a race car, right? Okay. So, you know, that's that's first problem, right? So you've automatically lost that, okay, do you really know who I am and what I'm doing? Yeah. And, you know, another question came up, he was talking about how he was hungry and trying to get enough calories in. And they said, well, couldn't you just put a turkey sandwich in the passenger seat? Oh. <laughs> well, there's no passenger seat in the race car. Yeah. So, you know, you have these, you know, one, there's no information out there. And then you have these kind of experts that they are truly experts, but they don't know about motorsports. And so I was very lucky in that I had that language. And then I made some great relationships mm -hmm. with drivers early on that really started to value this. And so you mentioned the, the book I wrote, the car on the cover is from Charlie Kimball, okay. who was a type one diabetic IndyCar driver. Huh. And if you think about they burn 2000 calories in a race and someone has a condition that affects metabolism, yeah. what does that do? So we had a great 10 year relationship of, you know, working through his endocrinologist, working with uh, how we manage insulin, how we manage mm -hmm. his caloric intake, his training. And through that experience, um, you know, I learned a lot about what it's like to be an elite level driver. And I really built a lot of trust with him. And then you kind of have to realize that race car driving itself is such a small community. Mm -hmm. And then the word of mouth traveled. So for example, his sister was the PR manager for the Mercedes Formula One team. Mm 
Okay. And then that's how that's what got me into F1, and then that's kind of how this all built. Oh. Oh, that's 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 fantastic. I I really. What, I'm just sitting. I'm just enthralled. This is just amazing to to hear this this work that you're doing. And thank you. Uh, and you know, I I really like you mentioned. You sort of brushed over the race uh, the race pit folks. I love that you're looking at the bigger picture about things that influence race car driving, and you know, pit crew is part of that. So yeah. I think that's neat. That, and it sounds like that was sort of a step that you had to take because of an equipment issue. But it's also really such an important part of race car driving. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny, John, it's, it's now come full circle for me in a way in that I, so the first study I ever did was thermal regulation in the Chip Ganassi racing pit crew, Okay, which it was a great experience. Like is the worst paper I've ever published. Oh. Like I still can't believe it was published. I look at the data. I look at my sample size and I'm like, I look at the things I wrote in the discussion. I'm like, you're horrible, but it was a great experience. Oh. And when I did that, I, so first off, all the drivers were like, no way. I don't want this. I don't want this equipment in the car and the equipment wasn't there. So I kind of decided, you know, I'm going to just be pit crews. I'm just going to do pit crews. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I had a series of studies I wanted to do. I had all these ideas. And, you know, just as research evolves, you know, we did two papers on them. They were great. Really enjoyed it. Great, you know, contributions to the field. We also had to show they were athletes, too, mm -hmm. because they were basically being asked to, okay, you got to carry a 40 pound tire, a 20 pound jack, run around the car. Oh. And oh, by the way, that surface you're running on, mm -hmm. you're one at an angle and two, it's really slippery. Oh. So, you know, they would say, yeah, usually by about July, we've had to replace the pit crew because they've blown their knee out or they're, you know, broken an ankle. So we did all that and, you know, just it evolved. Like I kind of, I connected with Charlie, we got back into drivers, the technology came around. Um, and I've always had these ideas for future pit crew studies. Mm -hmm. So fast forward now this past year, we had a, a grant from NASCAR to go do the driver stuff. And the pit crew guys were like, hey, we, we want to do this too. Can we do it? And so now I've got a, a master's student who was very similar to me and my mentality when I started, who's now going to do the pit crew studies. So mm -hmm. it's a nice full circle deal. I, I love that. I mean, that, that, it's just neat to see everything sort of weave together. And, and I'm going to go back to what we talked about earlier. I mean, you're following your passion and then finding out, you know, different ways to ask questions and, and uh, come up with answers for them. So I am curious now I'm going to ask you a research question. What has been the most interesting observation, maybe unexpected observation that you've made either of race car driving or pit crew? Um, that's a great question. I, I've got, can I, instead of one answer, can I give you three answers? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to cheat the question. Um, my favorite study, the one I am most proud of that I feel like I was the best scientist I could be was the case study I wrote on Charlie Kimball. Okay. We collected three years of data on him. And it was the first time that you were able to tie driver biology data to car data. Okay. And what we did was we took his blood glucose data because you can measure it, you wear a glucometer in the car, and we correlated that to his driving performance. Mm. And we found an optimal blood glucose range where he had the best performance. Wow. And I just thought that was so cool. Because when, if you go back to how I started, oh. everyone looked at the car and no one looked at the driver. Well, now I've correlated the data to that. Oh. And that led me into doing kind of what I'm doing now of trying to integrate car data and driver data to document fatigue. And we can discuss if fatigue is a real world or, or not and what that means. Mm -hmm. um, but... I always wanted to find a way of how do we know the driver is fatiguing and is that affecting car performance? Mm. Because as a, a race goes on, you'll hear the driver say the tires are going off, the car is handling bad, all this stuff, right? So 
Um, we have a, this is a research tool. I have to be very careful and make sure I say it's a research tool. We have a driving simulator in our lab. Um, it's not a toy. It is a research tool. So when my department chair walks down and sees me on it, I say it's a research tool. Um, so we did a study. That simulator is actually in an environmental chamber. So we manipulate temperature, humidity, all that stuff, just like you would in a, an actual race. And we, we, it was just published two days ago, which is very exciting. Oh, congratulations. The thing we found was as a driver fatigue, so you, know, you start to see you know, increased sweat rate, core temperature, they lose the ability to generate brake pressure and mm. modulate the brake pedal. Mm. So typically a car going into a corner it's a very hard push on the brakes. So if you're going to trace it over time, mm -hmm. sharp spike, and then it kind of has this modulating effect mm -hmm. of them bleeding the brake off to get the car to rotate. When they become dehydrated, it kind of becomes like this tombstone effect. Mm -hmm. So they can't generate the pressure, but to slow the car down, they have to hold the pedal longer, mm -hmm. which induces understeer, which tears the tires up, slows the car down, and makes the drivers complain about it. Mm. So my uh, my coolest thing I found, my thing I'm most proud of is that finally able to show that the driver is tied to the car and you see it in both the driver data and the car data. Yeah. Oh, that that is amazing. I love that 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 connection because it is, you know, mind body. But now you've got, you know, the car is part of this tool of doing performance yep. and that that ability to like you talked about modulate some aspect of driving. Yep. And and that is related to some physiological, uh, biochemical issue. Uh, that is that is really, that that's really cool. Thank you. Yeah, it's I I I'm not sure if you're, I'm talking very quickly because I get very excited about this stuff. I I'm passionate about it, so I'm glad other people think it's cool and like it. I never know if they're yeah. into it. Sometimes I think they just think I'm crazy. Um, <laughs> but no, like I love this stuff. I should. I promised I'd give you three things. I only gave you two. I should. Okay. Give you okay. The third one is actually one that uh, it's a study I'm, I'm kind of known for. It's a study I got two death threats off of, which is oh, always, uh -oh. if you don't get death threats from your research, you're not doing it correctly. <laughs> um, so we did a study on female race car drivers and kind of, you know, going back, uh, there was this notion that females were not strong enough to drive the race car. Hmm. And, you know, I'm kind of sitting there. So this is one of my halo projects of, I'd really like to document that. Like we can actually go and show like physical fitness, uh, fatigability, we can actually measure that. So we did the study where we compared female drivers to their male teammates. So same track, same car, so it should be relatively equal. And we found that females were very capable of driving the race car. They you know, didn't fatigue any different than the males. They responded the same way to the males. Uh, the only difference was the primary factor that influenced performance was seat time. Mm. So what we noticed was the female drivers, because they were kind of a novelty, they were accelerated through the ranks of racing. So instead of spending, you know, three years at this series, three years of this, they were accelerated up and they were put in a car that they probably weren't prepared for. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of neat to show that hey, if you give them the opportunity to drive and progress and have proper athlete development, they're going to be just as fine. And uh, I cannot take credit for it, but uh, the paper was cited uh, for the F1 Academy, which is now that all-female ladder series to put a female uh -huh. in F1. So I, I, they have no idea who I am or what I'm doing, but they did cite the paper, so I'll take it. But um, yeah, so in that process, I did get two death threats of keep women out of my nascar oh boy yeah that's that's really too bad but again impactful work i mean beyond yeah. just you know sport physiology i mean now now you're more into giving access to a sport uh and and defending that that that's okay and you know in our area of exercise physiology or exercise science in general Females are such a, a low number of research subjects. Yeah, it's yeah. really uh, impressive that that you you're you're at that leading curve of of looking at that in race car driving. Well, you know, like you're you're being very kind and very gracious to me, and I appreciate the compliments and all that. I really do. Um, but you know, it was just I had these questions. Yeah. I wanted to answer them, and 
you know, right now we're we're talking about the, the tip of the iceberg, right? Like you see the tip of the iceberg, you don't see what's all underneath. There was a lot of work to get there, a lot of work to do, a lot of effort. Um, and I, you know, for me, it was just fun. It was yeah. just fun to go do this stuff yeah. and think about this and look at the data and answer these questions. Um, and I'm very appreciative that people seem to care about it because yeah. I know I do. I just never thought anyone else would. I love it, and the passion comes across, and and I and and that's so important, uh, you know, for for students especially to hear. If you pursue your passion, then the yes, it's hard work. I mean, there's a lot of things, and you know, here you are innovating equipment. You're working with companies, industry, trying to build these. Rela I mean, there's a lot that goes into that manuscript that ultimately gets published, and and you know, a yes. lot of people don't know all that background work, but yet it's your passion. So yeah. that's so cool that 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 connects there. Yeah, and I think you know. So I, the other part of this job is I get to interact with great students all the time. I get to teach them stuff, right? And, you know, I'd be interested to, you know, what you think about this and what your experience is. But usually when I meet students and I talk about this, they're terrified of research. Yeah. I don't want to do research. Research is boring. Research mm -hmm. is hard. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm kind of like, well, it's kind of fun. Yeah. Like, you know, if you have something you're passionate about, you're going to go chase this question. Mm -hmm. Yes, there is a lot of work that goes into learn how to write scientifically, write grants, statistics, mm -hmm. all that stuff is your skill set. But if you're passionate about a topic, you'll learn this stuff. This stuff no. comes naturally, right? No. Um, and you know, I see a lot of students that you know get very burned out. They're like, oh, I don't want to do research, it's too much hard work and all this. And I I tell them, I'm like, well, are you interested in it? Do you do you enjoy it? Do you want to go do this stuff? And I do tell them, I'm like, you know, it's not always glamorous. Like mm -hmm. there are times where it's, you know, two in the morning and you're, you know, still at the racetrack waiting for the rain delay to clear. But, you know, it's, if you love it and you're passionate about it, it's going to be amazing. I will also say that I have worked 70, 80 hours a week to be able to make this happen so that this can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we're, we're sitting here talking and, you know, for me, it's, it's almost five o'clock no. and I consider that to be the halfway point in my day. Uh -huh. So, you know, like it's fun, but it is work, but it doesn't feel like work as long as you love it. Yeah, uh, I, that, that's true. And it sort of merges your interest with, with your work. And so that was going to be my closing question because I, I told you, I'd only keep you for a little bit, but my goodness, we I'm could, happy to talk. talk. As long as this, you want to this talk. is this is fantastic. So my my last question was going to be related to this: Are you able to watch a race car driving event and enjoy it for the sake of watching it, or are you there always thinking, "Oh, I wonder if oh, what's going on with that? How do I measure this?" The short answer is no. <laughs> um, I it is very hard for me to go to a race as a fan. Yeah, I I just because of that because I'm thinking like that. Um, you know, I will sometimes I'm at the racetrack, sometimes I'm home, and I'll have the race on, mm -hmm. and it's I'm not watching as a fan of who's going to get the points, who's going to get the chance. I'm looking for things like, all right, what's the temperature like? What is this stress? No. Um, you know, we do all this work, and then they change the car. Mm -hmm. or they change the rules mm -hmm. so you know you you mentioned um you know normal cars have air conditioners race cars don't mm -hmm. they're putting air conditioners in race cars now oh really oh but <laughs> but it's to keep the car at a set temperature uh -huh. and what the teams have figured out is they take the ac and they point it at the temperature sensor in the car uh -huh. and then the, the rest of the car heats up so we now have electric cars with the batteries next to the driver that are 50 degrees C, uh, an AC tube pointing at the temperature sensor that says it's 25 and the guys are cooking. Uh, so when I watch races, I'm looking for signs of evidence uh, that there's fatigue, performance loss, or safety. Um, I So I can't watch as a fan. I can't go to a race as a fan. Um, you know, I it's... I guess I'm trying to come up with an analogy of it. It would be the equivalent of if you were a, a, a master chef, mm -hmm. not that I'm a master, but like a chef that spends his whole day cooking and everything. Mm -hmm. And you went to someone else's restaurant 
And it was like, can you just enjoy the food? Yeah, yeah. I can't. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, that's great. I, I, David, this has been a fantastic talk. I, I really am impressed with the work you've done. I'm so glad there's a UNLV connection and that we yeah. crossed paths early on in, in your academic career. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, I, I really enjoyed this, and and maybe with F one coming to Vegas, maybe we'll we'll you know, get you here and and uh, and visit in person. Any time, I would love to come back. Thank you for this. This was so much fun. Um, usually, I'm hesitant to do these things okay. because uh, a I get very excited about it. I know I talk fast, and then I I want to tell all the stories and all the stuff. So. I, this one was one I was excited about to do, so I appreciate it. I would love to come back to UNLV in Vegas and, you know, A, just to see. I haven't been back since probably 2008, yeah. 2009. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to see it. I'd love to chat and do stuff. And, you know, the other thing with all this is, you know, we talked about the work I've done. I'm going to stop doing this at some point. I'd like to do it mm -hmm. for a little bit longer. So students that are interested that want to collaborate faculty mm -hmm. that want to do have another angle to look at uh my lab is open 24 7 to anybody mm. that wants to come learn and engage because mm. you know this science is best when it's a collaboration yeah yeah well and you're giving back i mean that's so neat that that's how you got into it someone invited you to your lab and yep. now that's neat that you're you're in that position uh encouraging others so that that's that's really fantastic i appreciate it thank you Awesome. Well, David, thank you. Thank you for uh, taking the time to do this. Really enjoyed it. And uh, we'll, we'll certainly stay in touch now. Won't be another, uh, you know, 15 years. So <laughs> I hope not. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everyone.